Welcome to In Conversation. I'm your host, Steve Iverson. Uh, today, our guest is uh, Marianne Stewart, who is a Lexington resident who's running for the 15th Middlesex District uh, State Representative seat that's being vacated by Jay Kaufman due to his retirement. Um, we're going to hear uh, what Marianne would like to accomplish in that role and uh, what separates her from the other candidates and uh, a bunch of other things as well. So thank you for coming on. You're welcome. Thank you. You bet. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background, especially as it applies to the job that you would like to have? Sure. I came up through the site council and the PTA over at Harrington School. Yeah. And then I was elected to two terms on the school committee and served as chair during the recession. Oh, okay. And then Governor Patrick appointed me to the State Board of Education. Mm -hmm. I've also been a community activist for more than 20 years, pounding the pavement for uh, workers' rights, better revenue, LGBTQ equality. And after that, the Raise Up Massachusetts Coalition asked me to lead on better funding for public education and public transportation. So my husband and I uh, have lived in Lexington for the past 24 years. Duncan, my husband, was born and raised in Lexington, and he still had deep roots here. So when we moved in 24 years ago, we came in through the affordable housing program at Lexhab and lived at Emerson Gardens for five years and then bought the house that we live in now, which is over in East Lexington near the Arlington Reservoir. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm over in East Lexington as well, but on the other side of Mass Ave, uh -huh. up behind Wilson Farm. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and uh, you, do you have children? We have three children, now oh. young adults. Okay. Uh, we have a going to be 28-year-old son who lives in Somerville and works in Boston. We have a 25-year-old son who lives in Denver and works in a... He's a research assistant at uh, Colorado University in mm. Denver. And then we have a daughter who will be 21 in February who's in a vocational education program. She has special needs, and so she hopes to graduate. She will graduate in the spring and then has plans to go to Middlesex Community College. Mm -hmm. Has that affected your own perspective on, um, on special needs programs and, um, um, and uh, the way they, they provide services to, to people? Oh, sure. I think uh, learning to navigate a complex system of services for our daughter has been, oh gosh, challenging and uh, rewarding also. But it's taken a, it takes a while to... Uh, develop, understand the language that's used and really figure out how to best advocate for her needs uh, with the system and so that everybody is on the same page and that we're all working in the same direction to mm -hmm. really help her move forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did uh, Was it essentially a, a helpful experience or was it also, um, I think uh, you're also saying that it was also difficult at times to, to make things happen the way they should? It's been very helpful for her. I'm glad okay. she's had services because okay. uh, that's been really critical to her success, to her development. Yeah. Yeah, necessary. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay. And um, um, this is the question that everybody gets asked. Why, do you, why are you running and why do you want this job? Serving as our next state representative is an opportunity for me to expand my call to service mm -hmm. and to extend my leadership on the critical issues that we face in the 15th Middlesex and mm -hmm. across the Commonwealth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've been boldly represented by Jay Kaufman for the past 24 years. And the issues that he uh, has, that we faced and um, the things that he has, the causes that he's stood up for, are still in front of us, and we're still going to need someone with a progressive voice and a courageous champion who's going to lead in the state house, who's going to stand up to leadership and uh, advocate for change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, have you met Jay? Oh yes, many. Mm -hmm. oh, of course, mm -hmm. I've. Mm, I'd say uh, we moved into town right about the time he was running for. 24 State years. rep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, our children were pretty little at mm -hmm. the time. And then once our youngest entered school, I realized I hadn't met him. So I called him. Mm -hmm. And I had been to a national conference 
and uh, had learned a lot of things about education funding. This was right after No Child Left Behind had been implemented. And I asked Jay if he could meet with me and then explain to me how the state funds public education. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know it at the time, but I have come to learn since, you know, Jay was one of probably half a dozen people who could really explain that. Mm -hmm. And so we met for coffee early in the morning, and I still have the little doodle that he drew to show me how uh, the state funds education through the Chapter 70 program, the foundation formula. Um and uh, how each community, you know, participates in that formula and then how the state does also. So it was a, that was the beginning of really checking in with him. And then after, uh, after doing that, I ran for town meeting and received a lovely note from Jay congratulating me on that. And then I asked if I could volunteer in his office that summer. That would have been 2006 And so that summer I volunteered in Jay's office just uh, doing odds and ends and just kind of seeing how things were done. And then he recommended me for the uh, Citizens Legislative Seminar, which is a, was, I don't know if it still is, but it was a six-week program once a week at the State House for about four hours. And it culminated with a mock Senate session in the Senate chamber with the Senate president. And at that time, it was uh, Robert Travellini. Mm-hmm. And uh, so when I did this was October through November of 2006. So I was there. Uh, they were... The sessions were held on Wednesdays from like 9 to 1. Mm -hmm. And so this was the day after the November election when Governor Deval Patrick was elected the governor. He was governor-elect, and there was a real energy and real electricity in the State House that day. Mm -hmm. A lot of excitement. And then it was also uh, the week that uh, Therese Murray was elected the first woman, Senate Mm -hmm. president. So there was a lot going on. It was a really interesting time to see that. We met with various uh, legislators, House leaders, and uh, Senate personnel, uh, Senate leaders, and really got uh, to hear from them about some about their campaigns, some about the issues that they were advocating for, things like that. So uh, it was it was a very uh, hands-on experience, and I really enjoyed the mock Senate session. Uh, they limited the number of people participating in the program to 40 so that you could each have a chair in the Senate chamber. And uh, that was a very fulfilling opportunity and really interesting time. So, yeah. That uh, got you that much more warmed up to the idea of being in politics. Absolutely. And at the time, I was really, uh, I was PTA president at Harrington and uh, what really drew me to that work was the uh, opportunity for building community. It was really, mm. that's the thing that I liked most about it. I think in the years before I became president, I had been asked many times to take on a leadership role there, and I felt like it was a, uh, you had to be a really good fundraiser. You had to be able to raise a lot of funds for the school. And then I realized uh, after attending some conferences that uh, no, the the parent, the PTA is not a the fundraising arm for the Department of Education. True. It is this large, the largest advocacy group for children in the country, and uh, so that did give me a, a sense of things. And I continued to pursue the advocacy component and work on policy um, for many years. Then, uh, for all those years, and then I ran for school committee in two thousand and eight. And, um, yeah, so. So what was that like being on the school committee in, in a town where uh, the schools are, are so um, valued and uh, um, so important? Well, I started on the school committee right as we began the, um, the Great Recession. Mm. So it was a very challenging time, but working with my colleagues on the, state, on, on the school committee, we were able to protect programs, we didn't have to cut any programs, and we didn't lay off any staff either. And we did that because we kept our focus on the needs of children and mm-hmm. classrooms. Mm-hmm. And I served as chair during the recession, and actually, uh, 
serving on the school committee uh, taught me the value of um, earnest questions and a soft heart. People care very deeply about their schools. Uh, we're very close to the community uh, on that level, uh, the school committee level with families and students. Myself, I had children in the system at the time. So it was very, um, you know, you were very, very close to the community and the issues that were uh, affecting them. Yeah, people care very much about the schools. They do. Um, pretty much everywhere. But um, we especially, um, we've, we've done a nice job with the schools here in Lexington. Um, they're always highly rated. I think people really um, put that very high on, the, on their priorities. Well, citizens are uh, deeply supportive of our schools. Uh, I think there's also a concern for all of the programs that the town is responsible for. Um, and we've been very responsible, the town has been, and uh, it, I think another credit to the system is the fact that we have a very stable community of educators. Once they come into the district, they're usually here for quite some years and uh, build their own communities of uh, educators and uh, rely on each other for support and to uh, help reach uh, every student. And also the, pa the families who are in the schools uh, are so uh, connected to really helping their, their student, their child succeed. So even before they get into school, parents are reading to their children, they're taking them on lots of, uh, oper you know, extending their learning through extracurricular activities and trips and travel and things like that. And certainly that continues through the years as well. So uh, it's a, those things in combination, I think, really help to uh, secure the strength of the school system here. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were elected, you would uh, represent not only Lexington, but parts of Woburn. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I imagine the Woburn school system would be of, of concern to you as well. Of and course, I'm, um, yeah. Um, I'm just, um, um, how do they compare, the Woburn school system and the Lexington school system? Well, Woburn has a very diverse uh, student body. They're not quite as large, as, the system isn't quite as large as Lexington's, but they're going through the same, uh, ma many similar things that we're doing in terms of uh, capital projects, building new schools, um, reconfiguring some schools. Woburn is fortunate to have a large rainy day fund, so they they have uh, good funding for their programs and for education. And they're very committed to education. So uh, when I when I knew I was going to run for the seat, I contacted everybody that I could on the uh, the mayor and the school committee and the uh, the city council, and to let them know that I was running for the seat and that. Uh, I would welcome any opportunities to meet and discuss any things that they'd like to. And certainly, if I'm fortunate enough to be elected, I would continue building those relationships sure. and uh, you know, improving all aspects of uh, community uh, in concert with the... They're, they're also looking for... Uh, going to be electing a new representative on the other parts of Woburn, the other five wards. So it will be a, an opportunity to work together with the new state rep for the district over on the other side of Woburn, as well as with our state senator, Cindy Friedman. Mm -hmm. And um, um, you're a Democrat, of course. Yes. Um, would you call yourself a progressive? And, and as these things go, would you say that you're a, a sort of a centrist Democrat or more to the left, more to the right? Or Those are very vague terms, but I think you know what I, what I mean. I've been a lifelong Democrat. Um, and, you know, our state house is full of, uh, has a super majority of Democrats. Yeah. Uh, and many Democrats there have been there a long time, and very many corporate Democrats. So a lot of them campaign as Democrats, but govern as Republicans ultimately. Okay. So I, as a progressive uh, Democrat, I, uh, I've been giving voice to progressive values for many years mm -hmm. for 
uh, equality for all, for fairness, for opportunity. Uh, we're the party of inclusion in general, the Democratic Party. Um, and so really advocating for, for change that in particular helps the most marginalized among us really helps everybody rise. Mm -hmm. So those are the values that I have been committed to. And it's the reason why I've received so many endorsements from progressive organizations across the state, Progressive Massachusetts, Progressive Democrats of Massachusetts, Mass Alliance, which is a coalition of progressive organizations across the Commonwealth, including unions and LGBTQ groups, women's groups, pro-choice, healthcare, environmental groups, they all say that uh, I will be the progressive choice in this race. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, what, what kinds of things would you say distinguish you from the other Democratic candidates who are running now? Well, certainly the years that I have spent uh, pounding the pavement on important issues, workers' rights, better revenue, LGBTQ equality, these are the issues that really matter in our environment today and across the Commonwealth. Um, and so I bring uh, an activist spirit. I would bring that to the State House. In addition to my experience at the local level and at the state level, I've been on numerous boards and committees and working groups and task forces over the years and uh, also worked with Progressive Democrats of Massachusetts to study our revenue options, and which is critical at this time. Uh, we really need to take a big look at everything that we can to bring revenue into the state. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah the, uh, the so-called uh, millionaire's tax um, mm -hmm. uh, didn't pass. What were your thoughts about that? Well, I think if we're going to talk about taxes, we have to understand two critical things. One, our taxes are inadequate. Mm -hmm. And two, they're unfair. And the millionaire's tax, I was actually one of 10 original signers to initiate the tax, uh, the ballot initiative going forward uh, to amend our state constitution, which was going to take four years to do at a minimum. Well, it would have required amending the constitution. Right. Which oh, was, I, which, I yeah. missed that somehow. Okay. Yes, yes. And which is why it required, uh, it started as a, so this was a citizen's initiative. And it began with citizens getting signatures and then bring, forwarding those to the legislature and then the legislature handing it off to the legislature for back-to-back -back constitutional convention. So it started in 2015 with the signatures. 2016 and 2017 were the back-to-back -back years for the legislative, uh, for the constitutional convention, which required a 25 percent um, support of the legislature, and it received over 70 percent of support from the legislature. So wow. that was tremendous, and that is a credit to Jay and his leadership in the state house. And then we were supposed to be able to put it in the hands of voters in November to make the final decision to approve the tax, which, as you probably heard, did have broad support. Yeah. Um, and the SJC, the Supreme Judicial Court, knocked it out of the hands of voters for November. So what that means is, and then they did it, it was on a technicality that's uh, primarily has to do with the fact that it started as a citizen's initiative. Going forward, we will need to refile the legislation as a legislative initiative. And under that um, condition, the same technicality doesn't apply, but the same process it remains. So it starts in the legislature. You still have back-to-back -back con constitutional conventions, and it will still take a minimum of four years before it comes to voters. In the meantime, we still have critical needs for this was money that was going to be raised revenue for uh, public education and public transportation. We still Those needs haven't gone away. We still have critical needs, and we can talk a little further about that if you'd like. But what I... Uh, you know, this uh, initiative would have taxed millionaires, anybody making over a million dollars, uh, the, the million and one would be charged 4% uh, additionally. And at that level, those who are the wealthiest among us would pay more of their fair share in taxes, but it still wouldn't bring, it, bring them up to what the rest of us pay. 
So, uh, but it was, it was an improvement, and I do believe that we should be taxing the wealthiest among us uh, more so that uh, we are paying more of our share, fair share. I, people at, uh, you know, people already are already feeling overtaxed, um, so we really need to take some critical steps to, to look at uh, how we're going to find that funding. And the Tax Fairness Commission that Jay was chair of several years back uh, came up with some, it was a bipartisan commission, and they came up with, I don't know, 15 or so recommendations. And among them were, was to um, institute a more progressive tax system Another is to do a full audit of the tax expenditure budget, and that has not been done. These recommendations came out in 2014, I think, or 15, I guess, and um, they haven't done this audit. We need to do that. We also need to take a critical look at uh, payments in lieu of taxes, uh, which are currently voluntary, but we need to really look critically at uh, nonprofits making a, a lot of uh, money probably, I don't know what the number is, maybe five, um, I, I don't know what the number is actually, but we need to make some decisions about uh, mandating that payment from some nonprofits. And that includes big universities, sure. places like that. Yeah, private and um, private uh, partnerships there, or private institutions and nonprofits. And I think uh, once we get a handle on some of that, we, sh we should also be looking at closing corporate tax loopholes. We at right now don't have a way to understand uh, the tax giveaways that we provide to corporations. We're not really, we don't know how accountable, there's no accountability for how much uh, they're actually, we're getting in, in exchange for the corporate tax giveaways. Um, and so I think it, that is a worthy exercise, particularly at this juncture. And also looking at the decriminalization of marijuana, uh, we can make some decisions about that once we get that off the ground and start seeing some revenue coming in from that as well. So um, all of this is coming into play. And, and also we, we just saw a surplus in the state, but uh, in revenues this year of about a, a billion dollars, a little over a billion dollars, and some decisions were made about how to use that. Uh, it's hard to tell at this point if that's going to be a recurring revenue stream, if we're going to continue to have uh, a billion dollars every year, and if we are, then we absolutely need to incorporate that into our budget for public education, public transportation, all of our public structures, parks and recreation, libraries, et cetera. Um, I think that uh, as we as we go forward, these are these are the challenges that we're really facing. The revenue issue is something that you have to understand. Um, about twenty years, beginning twenty years ago, some decisions were made by state Republican administrations to reduce our revenues by three to four billion dollars every year, and the state has never recovered. So we've gone from uh, we always start being in a hole when we're building the state budget. We're three to three and a half to three point eight billion dollars in the hole every year as we begin to build the budget and we're coming up uh, from that point under governor baker we've gone from one austerity budget to another and we really need to have more of a, a sense of will to fund the things that we can fund and really prioritize some of these things so those are some of the issues that I'm deeply committed to going forward if I'm elected to the state house. How do you think um, how do you think Governor Baker has, has done and uh, especially in the context of your own values and what you would like to work towards um, what would you say about uh, his performance? I think he's not done a very good job. I think the governor has uh, he came in saying he was going to be this great manager and, and everything, and he hasn't even managed very well. There are many, there are so many uh, ways that he's fallen down on this aspect. I, I couldn't recount them all, but I would direct folks to the Progressive Democrats of Massachusetts website, uh, progressivedemsofmass.org. They've put together a uh, document called the Baker Dossier, mm -hmm. which looks at all of the critical uh, pieces of our government and in the ways that he has 
not met the charge to you know, do the job. And so while I have not taken a public position on any of the uh, governor um, candidates, gubernatorial candidates, uh, we have two very good candidates, and I would really love to see them, one of them, uh, get elected as our next governor. And that is very, very possible. We absolutely need to work for that. We can do it. Yeah, he's a Republican, but in some ways, I, I guess, um, since he's in Massachusetts, he's he's governed uh, a bit more as a Democrat than he might have in some other states that are by, by nature more Republican. I don't know that I would agree with that. Okay. I think he's... Uh, very clearly a Republican and has uh, supported many of the Republican uh, agenda. So okay. uh, when you just look at the Safe Communities Act, for example, we know about the tearing apart of families that's happening at our southern border right. of the country, but right. there's a lot that's happening here in Massachusetts. The uh, aggressive deportation and detaining agenda, detainment agenda of the Trump administration is being played out here in Massachusetts. Lexington passed a resolution to protect the uh, immigrants in our community and uh, the undocumented and any refugees, uh, but they are still being separated from families for lengths of time. And in fact, the Homeland, Sec the Regional Office for Homeland Security and the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, ICE, is right around the corner from us in Burlington. And uh, I, was, I was there with some people from Woburn and surrounding communities in February to protest their uh, aggressive agenda and um, met a gentleman who had been separated from his family for a month not for any, he, no criminal charges. Um, there were some civil issues, but nothing criminal that required, that re truly required him being separated from his family. But I, he had been released the night before, and then we met him that morning and uh, had a little protest outside the uh, Homeland Security building there. And um, I think it's, it's, you know, without getting into just the, it's appalling what's happening nationally. Um, but it's equally as disturbing here in the state. And the governor wasn't going to support the Safe Communities Act, uh, even though vast majority of legislators, legislators supported it and uh, it was the right thing to do. Morally, it's just the right, it was the right thing to, to be doing and it just completely got left out of, even as a budget amendment um, for the FY19 budget. So, and it's not, it wasn't even the first time this bill had come forward. The Safe Communities Act has been an opportunity for the legislature to take action for many years, uh, six years, I believe. So, and they have yet to, you know, had yet to do it. The um, House leadership, this is another example, House leadership just didn't want to have the debate in the House to let legislators have the debate. We should be having debates. Certainly the representatives who represent their communities across the Commonwealth deserve to debate the issues. If we come up short and the, issue, and, and the votes fail, then we live to fight another day. But if they pass, if it passes, then that is progress for our communities and for our Commonwealth. And we absolutely don't have that kind of support in the leadership whether that's the governor or the uh, Speaker of the House. Okay. Um, I'm afraid we only have a couple of minutes left. I'm amazed at how quickly <laughs> this time has gone by. Yeah. Um, but is there anything you'd like to make sure you, you mention before we stop? And I include that, um, including that things like uh, you might want to mention your website. And sure. Things like that. Sure. I invite uh, voters to check out my website, MarianneStewart.org. I'm also on Facebook at uh, Marianne Four Number Four Rep. So look for Marianne Marianne Stewart for State Representative. I'm on Twitter at M A Stewart M A and Instagram at M A Stewart M A. And uh, I, yeah, I would love to have people catch up with me there. I usually post various uh, links to articles and uh, reports and things like that and try to stay on top of things on the website with the blog and statements from various decisions that are happening right now as a result of the budget process. So uh, it would be an honor to serve as our next state representative and I humbly ask for your vote on Tuesday, September 4th. Thank you. 
uh, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, it was a pleasure meeting you. Thank I, you. I learned a lot. Got a nice sense of your passion about social issues in particular. Um, and I wish you the very best of luck. Thanks a lot, Steve. You bet. It's been In Conversation. Uh, we've been speaking with Marianne Stewart. And uh, thanks for watching.